My guest today, Jia Pingli, is the founder and principal at Empatico. She is passionate about leadership, place making, organization culture, the arts and communities, and how each of these are intertwined in helping build vibrant economies and places. Due to her passion and her services as a leader, she is one of the board members of Placemaking X, chairperson of Placemaking Malaysia under the auspices of Malaysian Institute of Planners. She has also been working with UN Habitat, Stipo, Twin City and Project Public Spaces. In this episode, we talked about her experience and lessons from this incredible journey of working for public spaces and serving her nation. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani. And I am bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Hello. Hello. Yeah, finally we are here. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So so thankful for you to, you know, invite me to do this. I'm very honored to have you here because I have been looking forward to talking to you for quite a long time. Congratulations for your place making a uh, week um, in Malaysia. It was uh, incredible. I loved the presentations and the speakers how they presented. I love that. It was amazing. Oh, thank you. So inspirational. Okay, so shall we start with the questions because I have been looking forward to learning sure. from you for quite great time. Let's start. Okay, so Peng, tell me what sure. inspired you to be a uh, what inspired you to be a placemaker, and how did you find your passion for public spaces? Um, so I have been uh, involved in the arts. So I used to be a performer. Then I went to production management. And then I went to theater. So I've always been very concerned about. Places that have uh, that deal with a lot of people, right? And um, and my work then led me to teaching uh, kids about production management. So it's always about space, and in in the arts, we're always talking about lack of space. Um, and so then, what happened was um, I had a client called uh, Think City, and they were asking me to look at their branding, which I then did, and. Because of that, I had to go and find out what they did, and I had to explore the city with new eyes to look at the section that they were doing. And this was in 2014, and uh, and so because of that, I kind of went. Um, well, I'd always realized that the heritage core of Kuala Lumpur was in decline, and then when I went back, um, I was very shocked at how bad it was in the state, and it was also a time when. Um, Politically, uh, a lot of citizens were not happy with with the government, and it felt like a. When I was asked whether I would take this job, it felt like a call, and um, because we 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 were not a nation to really speak up in that sense, I felt that this could be a good call for me to serve the nation. You know, not to be a politician, but something that I could kind of get involved in, and I could help the community at least. Um, have a better livable or a livable space. All right, awesome. That's awesome. Like you were moved by the serving, the purpose of serving the nation. Yes. Awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So tell me that advocating for public spaces as a woman. How has been the experience and how important do you find your voice in this field? And how is it while living in a Muslim Asian country? What, what, what has been the experience so far? Um, well, you know, in Malaysia, there are two, we're governed by two um, laws. So because I'm not Muslim, um, I'm governed by the federal, federal law. But uh, my Muslim sisters, they're governed by the Sharia law. I'm sure you're very well aware of the Sharia law. And so um, we are a nation that moves along two lines, I always say, the non-Muslim 
line and the Muslim line, and we have to be very clear on the divide uh, and and how do then unite each other, even though there are separations, right? And so that's what um, I feel is the power of Malaysians, um, our ability to kind of circumnavigate all of these uh, laws that govern us uh, and all of these differences. I mean, you know, we, we uh, two decades ago or three decades ago, as I was, you know, uh, maturing and growing up in this country, it was a very different country and we were much more together as a nation. The, the whole separation of races, a whole separation via religion was not as prevalent as it is now, but because the government has used religion as a political tool, it has kind of separated a lot of us. So um, in a sense, I really feel that um, it's so important for women of you know, all religions to be involved in uh, any service to the nation because a lot of times their voices are not heard and, um, and there are also different religion, uh, religious issues at play. So uh, while I, f I don't feel like I, am, um, I have been totally disadvantaged for being a woman, you have Muslim women who um, are disadvantaged because of the patriarchy, you know, uh, and uh, because also we have this law in the Sharia that allows for wives Right, so there are all of these um, what we call the 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 battle between modernity, religion, and traditionalism. Right, so those are are all very sensitive issues to navigate, and so I feel that the public space is a neutral space that they can come together, and they can use the public space to meet uh, and to get to know people of other religions, to get to know people are different from them which I feel is so valuable in a public space and um, and unfortunately we don't have enough of these public spaces that are open to all so you know I love it that we have public spaces in, in front of mosques um, all mosques have this temple at, at, in front of the gates and everybody is welcomed in there and I love it that we have small parks but I think we need to have uh, much more uh, formal and informal public spaces. Yes. All right. Okay, so we had a talk before that Malaysia is safe for women at any time of the day. What is it that makes you feel safe? What adds to your feeling of safety and comfort there? Uh, so Malaysia, uh, like any city or any country, um, is mostly safe, but then there you have to be aware of your surroundings at all times, right? Um, we're not like other countries where you can leave your bag unattended and and go and get something. You, you know, we're not that that country, unfortunately. Um, but what? So it's very important to know where you are at all times and to be aware of your surroundings. And that's how we navigate the city, and that's how I feel safe. Um, and then also, what you do is you try not to go places where there are no lights, no street lights or dark places or places where there's a lot of um, bars and pubs where a lot of drinking goes on. So, you know, as a woman, um, we know how to navigate certain areas. Like, so by a certain time, we make sure we're home or if we need to be out, we drive. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, a car is a, a tool of safety for us. You know, it's not a luxury for many women. Um, it is a safety tool and um, it is also a tool for independence. So now a lot of women are using cars and a lot of women have started driving um, motorcycles, right? Um, because it's sometimes it's not safe if I have to work late and go home late to go back on a bus, right? Or to um, go on a uh, light rail transit, even though on board you're safe, but the last mile, it may present some dangers, you know, if it's too late at night and, and things like that. Yeah. Yep. And you also, uh, you also mentioned that surveillance helps you there. So what kind of surveillance is available and how do you have, how have you created that? Um, so in terms of surveillance, are you talking about police surveillance? Uh, you, 
uh, maybe police surveillance or the natural surveillance in the oh, okay so um so what we talk about in public spaces is that we always look at designing open areas you know uh, and have places where you don't have nooks and crannies and corners that people can hide in you know our predators can hide in and and uh, look for their victims so and that's why it's so important to have public to activate public spaces because you have eyes on the street all the time so um you know when we talk about uh, city at eye level it's all the eyes on the street right um and there's always a safety that you feel when you're in a place that is crowded right um and and that's what place making does is when you design a place you ensure that there is always places where tons of people can gather and sit around and i don't know whether you remember ethan's have you ever seen ethan's slide with the bilbao and there's one corner where you know it's a blind it's a blind spot and that's the corner where the pickpocketers or the thieves um love because that's where they they snatch your bags and things like that because nobody can see it and it's not a corner that people want to congregate in so um when we talk about uh surveillance not so surveillance but eyes on the street that's what you used to do you, in place making you design or you activate areas or you make it in such a way that there is a flow of people and then people can see what is uh you know like in a, if you look at a 360 point of view you can see quite far away and you can immediately see if like you know sometimes i'm on the street and i see a child running first thing i do is where's the mother or where's the father so I, i i don't know what is it programming i don't know what it is but i immediately look behind the child to see if there's a mother watching or there's a father watching or someone running after the child right and if i don't see i will continue watching the child until i feel the child is safe so this is what community does right if yeah. you know um and especially if if they're your f- neighbors or family you know um you can always ask them to take to care or or look after or watch out for your child in a neighborhood and that's what we in the big cities have lost that ability to look after um the other person you know um, yeah, the, and and that's yes the empathy element right yeah well the empathy element and also the community element and the neighborly element yeah. right where you know sometimes um my mother would say to the neighbor oh i've got to go and get um vegetables can you make sure my daughter is safe and then the neighbor goes go 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 it's fine fine i'll i'll look after her right so that's that's the communal spirit that you you want to bring back and because we are so separated by our gadgets we're so distracted that sometimes we don't know what's going on and actually we need to know what's going on you know in our neighborhoods right because yeah. immediately we can tell if someone is a stranger and then we would immediately say oh okay what does this person want and what's he after and and things like that so i think that more people need to be invested in their surroundings yeah great analogy great okay so i noticed that you are passionate about heritage art and culture you have experience of working on regeneration in the heritage core of kuala lumpur which was basically meant to accelerate the heritage and place making agenda in malaysia tell me about the experience and how important is this aspect for a country and a city so um when we talk about uh place branding uh it's always very important to have um sites that differentiate you right so you go to paris and the first thing you do is either you go to the eiffel tower right or you go and visit um famous boutiques or you know you go to visit um other famous sites right you go to rome and you go to colosseum so i always say what is it that when you go to kuala lumpur do you go and see is it the twin towers um which is fine but is there anything that's older than the twin towers with more historical um uh perspectives so when we talk about the heritage core of kl um i feel that it is so important for the narrative of kuala lumpur to understand to to give the genesis of kuala lumpur right so the area that um i was previously working on 
that was the birthplace of Kuala Lumpur. That was where Kuala Lumpur got its name. So there is this um, confluence. So Kuala is a confluence and um, Lumpur is mud. So it's the muddy confluence. Uh, and, and that spot of the confluence is one of the oldest masjid mosques in Kuala Lumpur. Right? And then the whole area, Kuala Lumpur grew from there. Now, you know, when you, as a tourist or as someone who chooses a place to work, it is the history and the stories and the narrative of the place that makes it so unique. There's no point going to a, a country that looks like another country, right? So if we all go to shopping malls and the only reason why we visit another city is to go to the shopping mall, then we are a poorer country for it and a poorer city for it. Yes. And the one thing that I love about Malaysia is that they have chosen the very amazing and iconic sites for the mosque. You know, we I have seen that there is a mosque uh, on the seashore. The, the areas they have chosen, they have chosen for the mosque is very iconic and very, very much, um, you know, um, high in state, high in real estate. That's yes, great. Yeah. That's great. Very great. Um, uh, uh, land use inspiration. Okay, so you say that empowered communities are an important component for a vibrant economy. How can we empower communities according to you? Um, so I think one of the things in um, Asian countries, and we're seeing it now in, in many Asian countries, is the power of the voice, right? Um, speaking out, uh, against um, things that are not right. So again, what we try to do in public space is to make it non-political. And so, you know, if you speak up, then it's because it's your community, it's your neighborhood, it's your backyard. So I think that one of the things is to give a platform to listen to these people, right? To say, let's, let's not make it about race, or let's not make it about politics. Let's just make it about how do you feel living and working in this place? Do you feel safe? Uh, if you can't walk properly, if, you know, if you have a disability, can you get around? Um, and how can we um, make this place better for you? Right. So I think that um, one of the things is local governments or governments should create platforms for voices to be able to be received, right? And received without judgment um, in a way and received it and immediately then show that their voices have been heard and their, um, what they're saying has been taken into account and then acted upon. So you can't have just a platform to listen, but then not, it goes nowhere. So you need to not just listen, you need to also act. And once people start seeing that their voices matter, they will start speaking up more or even they will take up volunteer, volunteer roles to do community projects, right? So, um, so for me, I, I took up a, a, pro a job that served the nation. And as a result of what was happening in Malaysia, a lot of people took up volunteer projects. Like they would just plant a, um, a urban farm or they would build something because they felt that they were vo voiceless. And this was the, in the public space was the only place that they could do it, that they could contribute in a non-political manner. Right. I get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I heard you talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Share some of his details and how did you come to relate it to public space and advocacy and placemaking? I found it interesting and relatable to what I consider while planning activities for public spaces. So when we talk about place strategy, um, the really, really popular or strong places are places where people feel that they belong, right? So if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, um, he talks about security as the bottomless layer. Then he talks about food as the next layer. And then he, the third layer is belonging or connection, 
right? And his theory was that you have to have the first two. And without the first two uh, and then belonging, you cannot self-actualize. I think that you need belonging. And sometimes even if you have no shelter, if you have belonging, it's, it's smoother to self-actualize because we have seen people who have food, who have shelter, who become um, predators or who become not so well adjusted um, uh, people in the society. And then we've also seen people who have been refugees, yeah, who have no shelter, who then become um, you know, amazing uh, contributors to their community and then they and and also you look at them self actualizing where they become very spiritual where they grow as human beings or as a human soul as we say so actually it is all about building belonging and connection so that's what spaces do why do you go to a square that you, that you know you keep go why do you keep going to a square because you feel belonging there you know why do you keep going to a shop so um, i wrote a piece for san francisco moma about it was titled my home has no walls and how i keep going to this muslim indian tea shops because they know my name they like oh how are you doing today and, and you know and it's about that bit sense of belonging and sometimes people don't feel that they belong in even in their own homes sometimes people don't feel like they even belong to their families but they find places where they feel that they can be who they are and be accepted for who they are. And, and that's what uh, places have the power to do. Places and the community that resides in those places do. Yes, it's all about human connection and humanity, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So I found this Tampacticos Anatomy of Hope. Wow. <laughs> Explain this to me. I wanted to know about it because it's very interesting and I love how you have described the four terms in your own way. How did you conclude it? And I want to know that. <laughs> so tempatico um, means it's a hybrid of tempat, which is place in Malay, in the Malay language, and simpatico. Simpatico is Spanish for building an affinity. So what we strive to do is look at uh, building or places that have affinity with the people around them. Many times people build things in silos and to the um, adverse reaction of the existing community that's there. And so one of our key um, philosophies is that we're here to put hope back into places that have no hope, right? So, which is what... Uh, um, I and my team were trying to do in Kuala Lumpur because it had seemed so hopeless. But through grants, through the whole um, transformation program, we had managed to inject hope back into it. And then the pandemic hit. And now it's almost like going back to square one. But we had already embedded a new community in the place, right? To live alongside and to work alongside the existing community. Um, so in marketing, we have this this term that says that, you know, uh, there will be attrition. People will retire. People will sell their shop. Um, trades will no longer exist because no, they can't find anyone to, um, to replace them, like the, the rattan weavers, the tin smiths, and, and all of that. Um, and so you cannot stop progress. But what you can do is you can introduce things that are not so damaging to the area so that it allows for a nice um, unification. So like the old and the new, I think both have a place. And people talk about gentrification, like um, do our programs, you know, if, if you do any intervention programs, do they gentrify the area? Uh, and in Kuala Lumpur, I always say, you know, I, it was already gentrifying through skyrocketing, um, rentals and property prices <clears throat> because those never went down. But the adverse effect of that gentrification was that you had landlords who would cram 20 people 
in a 500 square feet room. And that's where they would house the migrants and in a very inhumane way. Um, and so what you had was soaring property prices and dilapidation at the same time. You know, it was a very, very strange phenomenon. So what we wanted to do was to put in some modernity services to send the signal to the younger people that there, you can also participate in rebuilding the old area of Kuala Lumpur. And what we wanted to do was to say, if you come back and live here, um, then it would stop people from moving out, right? Because people started moving out because the suburbs were so much shinier, newer, and better. And, you know, you, you mustn't forget that Kuala Lumpur is a very, very new city. It's only about 160 years old. So, you know, um, we don't have deep, deep roots like other cities like Penang uh, up north or even, you know, Jakarta, which has deeper ties and deeper neighborhoods. So KL is so much more fragile as a result of this transientness right? and this, this new history that's just been, um, uh, it, it, well, I mean, it's a very young city as compared to a lot of other cities in the world. Yes, very inspiring. And yes, youth is where we have to put our efforts so they can take it forward. Great. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I haven't, uh, that I forgot to answer your question about um, how do I weave it together. So the thing with um, uh, hope is that for cities, what gives hope? Great leadership, right? So you need great leadership to be able to kind of uh, whether it's, it's leaders at the government level or it's leaders from the community level. So you need great leaderships and great leaders only uh, emerge if they have a strong sense of purpose, right? So we have a, um, one branch of the anatomy of hope called the inner place. So the inner place talks about how you need to build your inner um, spirituality or your inner uh, leadership abilities to be able to then effect change for the better in urban places, in corporate places, or even cultural places. So at the moment, what we're seeing worldwide is that we are in a leadership crisis because, um, well, I mean, you know, let's, let's call the elephant in the room because of corruption, because of greed, because of, um, you, you know, uh, A, um, I matter more than the other. So what we want to say is nobody matters more than the other. It's, you know, you are the other and, you know, and not only are you important, but the earth that supports you is also just as important. The trees, the, the flowers, the, the fishes, the animals, you know, we are all here um, coexisting. And every time we forget that, places come under crisis. Yes, amazing. Okay, so next question is, you live in a Muslim Asian country and it is way better than other countries in terms of its public spaces and opportunities. Share some lessons of how it has come this far and shed some light on it. Um, so, A, I think that we had very enlightened leaders when Malaysia was formed, um, when, you know, uh, and they um, took some of the best ideas from uh, our colonial um, masters, which then was Britain. Um, and they, they, and also uh, the English left with them a system, which then our leaders followed. And that system has worked quite well for us. Like, so the road planning, yeah, nicely planned roads, um, the education system, uh, and the, the system of governance. Um, so all of that has really worked very well for us. And we have kind of been building on that ever since, right? Um, so, you know, our laws generally work. Um, and we all, uh, and also, you know, we had a leader who really understood that in order to build us up, we needed to, um, build a brand that was proud that could actually be known in the world and that that led to the Petronas Twin Towers it was a 
country branding effort. And because of that, he said, well, you know, if we're going to be progressive, if we're going to go towards developed nation status, then we need to put in place certain things like good infrastructure. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll continue on with the infrastructure uh, plans that uh, the, the British left us and uh, then move forward from there. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic that those very same leaders have led us to this path now. Uh, so they were enlightened in one level. And then, you know, when they talk about um, uh, absolute power corrupts, then, you know, there was that decline. So we are um, still enjoying the, um, the visions uh, of those leaders, right? But slowly, it is all coming apart at the seams as, um, you know, corruption and greed uh, are now starting to really take hold and it's now, you know, quite systemic in, in, in Malaysia. So, you know, if you ask me this in 10 years' time, I hope to be able to say something just as positive um, and to say, you know, Malaysia has really gone through uh, some strife, but we're, we're actually rebuilding and everything seems great, you know. So that's my hope um, for the world. And, and I think that, you know, we can't dwell on all the negativity. We just need to find solutions to make things better and be more positive. Yes, and it was in itself a positive message from you. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to our wrap-up questions. Uh, so, Peng, what drives you, what keeps you focused on public spaces? Um, so, I, I think what drives me is my commitment to serve. So, I've always known from a young age that I'm here on this earth to serve. And uh, it's taken me a while to find out what that service was, uh, whether it was through a charity organization or through serving um, a heritage body. Um, and I think it is only now when I discovered public spaces, suddenly at leadership, it's all started to click, right? So I now feel as if this is where my service belongs, you know, um, and this is where I can do the most, um, the most good in that sense. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, I think that that's where um, the passion lies, that when you do great public spaces, it is the community and people that gain from it. And, and I've always wanted to serve people. Um, so I think this is like the, the best way to do it. Amazing. May Allah reward you for that. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, so share your proudest moment of your work life. Um, so there have been uh, a few uh, moments. So one is when I was advocating for artists in hospitals. Uh, and these are um, uh, painters, singers, uh, clowns. And, um, and this was with the help of the British Council. I basically brought in some artists to basically advocate in the hospitals for them to actually set up um, arts in hospitals as a way to heal people quicker. And, um, I, and because there was no one willing to pay at that time, it was 20, 25 years ago, um, uh, what had happened was I had to give it up. And, but in my despair of, you know, I thought I had wasted my life doing this to no avail. Um, ten, year, 10 years later, I discovered uh, someone who was doing clowning in hospitals in Malaysia. And I basically reached out to him and I said, I'm so glad you're doing this. And um, he said, you know what? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Because I was in the audience when you brought in the artists who talked about clowning and, I, and because of that, I was inspired to do clowning. So that was one proud moment, um, you know, and I'm very grateful for British Council for that moment. And the other moment is um, Kebun Kebun Bangsa. Uh, so Kebun Kebun Bangsa is this community urban farm that runs along the lines of the electrical cape pylons. So, you know, those big pylons, and then they always have empty land underneath it. 
So um, what had happened was my team and I, when I was working in Think City, was able to connect the, the visionary uh, who wanted to do this with City Hall. And then uh, Think City was able to give uh, him and his team a grant. And so he set up Kebun Kebun Bangsa in 2016, no, 2017. And it had hit many bumps and the roads and um, DBKL, City Hall was going to give up. He was going to give up. And I basically fought and said, no, you can't give up. You can't, you, you have a vision and you need to honor your vision, right? And, um, and, you know, it may not be this area where the community is against you. There, and the pylon runs for miles. Please choose another place. And so now for, where are we, 2016? So um, almost four years later, it is now self-sustaining. So it funds itself. And it is, during pandemic, it had enough vegetables to feed the homeless uh, and some orphanages. Uh, and it's got enough of a volunteer committee that goes in every Wednesdays to harvest the food for the community. And it, during pandemic times, it was um, an oasis for people to, uh, to ha hang out because they were all locked down. So I'm, I'm particularly um, blessed that I was able to play a role in, in bringing that about. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. And the team that was with me and one of my team members is now a full-time volunteer. So here's a shout out to Joanne who has kept the dream alive and kept it going. So she now volunteers to take groups around, to, to fundraise, to take fundraising groups around. Um, so, you know, when we talk about impact and sustainability, I think that's what you need to aim for, you know, with a public space. And, and also the the minister of um, local government went to see it and she's totally in favor of it. Uh, so yeah, the, and she's looking at um, creating a policy for urban farming. Great, these are amazing ideas indeed, very inspirational and we, shall, we should do it as well. Awesome. Okay, so what was your hardest moment or the struggling moment of work life? <laughs> so the hardest moment was so much to do and so little time, right? And, uh, and the problem was that um, because we were almost like a startup uh, during the Think City moments was um, there was so much to do and so much to advocate. And I forgot myself and my health. In, you know, because you really want to do a good job and you really want to serve. And there are so many people you need to talk to, so many people you need to meet, so many things to do. Um, and what happened was um, my health deteriorated. So, and, you know, as a result, as you're fighting the good fight, you kind of forget, oh, you have to fight for yourself as well. So the hardest moments was trying to do all of this um, while the health was deteriorating. And uh, yeah, so, um, but so the pandemic was a really good gift because it, nothing was happening. So we, I got to just rest, right? So now I'm, I'm almost back to normal um, and I'm now raring to go. And I think that's what you need. You need to have that time. So even the darkest moments, sometimes um, you do come out of it. And as long as you keep hope, that hope that you know there is light at the end of the tunnel if you reach for the stars even if you don't get a star you're not going to come up with a handful of mud either right so um i always believe that if you think you can't you can't but if you think you can you most definitely can so it is about it's part of the coaching that i impart and a part of that leadership ethos that, you know, I feel everybody should have. And I'm so grateful to be surrounded by people who think they can. So like, you know, um, think city thought they could. Um, we have steeple who think they can. We have Malaysian Institute of Planners who adopted placemaking Malaysia. They are full of hope for placemaking and they're going to campaign on with together with us for better planned cities with placemakers. So, I mean, you know what a blessing to have um an amazing team of colleagues uh and then there's placemaking x you know and my colleagues there at placemaking x 
Um, so, you know, I think with placemaking, I, I say, come and be a placemaker because you can find family there, you know. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so share your favorite quote from placemaking. Oh, oh dear. I'm not very good at uh, remembering quotes. Um, but I think that the one uh, from Jane Jacobs about cities are built uh, only if, if people build them. Yeah, you know, that, that one where it's about people building cities and not cities built for people, right? So it's about the communal effort from bottom up. All right, yes. Okay, share your opinion about Pakistan or placemaking in Pakistan. So I feel that um, Pakistan has so many gifts in terms of, I, I feel also that, you know, um, this is a country that values community, right? And you eat together, you sit together, you break bread together, um, you have great cricket. <laughs> Yay, go Pakistan team. <laughs> um, and it's all about community, right? You know, um, it doesn't matter how poor your community is. As long as you have a cricket bat and a ball or even a stick and a ball, people on dusty streets can play cricket and get together and play. So the great thing about Pakistan and the most valuable thing, and I hope you never lose it, is that ability to come together. Right. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you have great infrastructure or whatever, as long as you have that bond, um, I think that there's always hope to be an amazing country and uh, because it starts with community. Thank you, Bing, for your kind words. It was it's really heartwarming. Um, yeah, we have that essence and I hope we keep that essence alive. So finally, any message for the global leaders out there as many new young placemakers are joining in? Um, I think that if you become a placemaker, the first thing you need to do is to set your ego aside. And, you know, everybody has ego and we all, we all have to look at ourselves and we always have to ask ourselves, why are you doing this? Is it for you or is it for the for the bigger picture is it for the good of the community and then you say and while doing this will you also grow as a person and will you also be um better for it in terms of health yeah and in terms of wealth because you know we all need to pay bills right so a ask yourself why? Why are you doing this? Does it fulfill you? Does it meet your purpose? Um, and so that's what I would ha have to say to all people who want to be placemakers. Don't feel that you have to save the world um, if you're in turmoil. Save yourself first and then come or maybe come and maybe the family will help heal you and then we can heal the community together, you know. So, yeah, so... One of the things with, with Maslow is placemakers um, are a group that you belong to. Great. I loved it. Uh, so I had this feeling that, uh, Bing, you are so versatile and you have a great command on what you say and how you say it. And literally this interview has just proven it. Thank you so much for your time and for your energy and for your generosity of sharing your knowledge. I love talking to you. Take care and let's stay connected. Yeah, thank you so much for asking me. And, you know, anytime you need help, just um, Facebook me or email me. Yeah, I, I think we have a lot in common. So, yes, you know, and I can bring in some of my Muslim friends and, you know, you can then have that commonality as well. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.